We're delighted that you've chosen to study at Grace Theological College and in the area of pastoral counselling. A course that's designed to help you be more effective in encouraging the people that you fellowship with at your church on Sundays and how to speak a word of encouragement to them which blesses them in the things of Christ and moves them on in their Christian lives. So I'm going to pray now and then uh, we'll get into start talking about the course. <clears throat> Father God, we are so grateful to you for the day that you've given us, for the strength that you've given us today to do our labours, for the grace that you've shown to us in all our relationships. We thank you for the way you've provided for our every need and necessity. But most of all, Father, we thank you today for the Lord Jesus Christ who has forgiven our sins, forgiven our sins without constraint and without compulsion, but freely and, gl and gladly in the uh, sacrifice of his Son. We thank you that we can come here tonight as men and women who have had our sins forgiven and who are able, therefore, to be able to stand before you, to stand before your throne and know that in you we have uh, redemption in the Beloved and that we have in the gifting from the Holy Spirit all that we need for life of godliness. We ask, Father, that you would use this time together to encourage and develop us in our ability and our desire to minister the grace of the gospel into the lives of others. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this course is designed to um, <coughs> help you be better able to encourage the Lord's people. Now, in the, uh, those enrollment forms I've given you, uh, some of you already filled yours in, it's uh, uh, <coughs> the training centre is Manuera, looking across the top line there. The year is 2012, and then you have an option between credit and audit. Let me just explain that difference there. Um, if you do the course for credit, then you do all the readings and you do all the written assignments and you sit the exams and you, uh, you gain credit uh, for the course that you've done and that enables you then to build on with more courses towards a certificate in pastoral counselling or any other certificates we offer here. If you don't want to do that and you only want to uh, audit the course, that means you come and you sit in on the lectures and uh, you are uh, uh, free to, uh, to purchase the books and take the readings and read them at your leisure, but there'll be no uh, assignments to hand in, no exams to sit, and no credit to be gained. The difference in the cost is a 50% difference, and the credit is $115 per credit hour, and with the audit, it's half that amount. Now, <coughs> I'll just say what I say every time, at the stage of a course, if you want to get the full benefit of this course for your own life and for the life of the body of Christ, then I would encourage you to do the course for credit to do the assignments, to do the readings, and to study the material for examination purposes is going to ensure that you learn it and get a blessing from it. There will be blessing in being in the classroom, but in order to take that blessing and have it built into your life and then into the lives of others, I would encourage you to take the course for credit. Well, before you take it for credit, you probably want to know what you're in for before you make that decision. So I'll just uh, hand out here the the course requirements. <coughs> By the way, this is uh, this is Hans over here, and Hans is going to be recording uh, this course for the rest of the semester. And um, so he'll be with us each night, putting this um, material onto disc for us. Thank you, Hans. So the objective of this course is to study the principles, approaches, and issues necessary for developing skills and discernment in pastoral counselling for effective and mutual care within the body of Christ. So it's not necessarily a course for pastors or a course for counsellors. It's a course for exactly the people we have here tonight. These are the course requirements. First, there is a self-counselling project. And uh, <coughs> I have a handout here 
which will guide you in your self counseling Now, the self-counselling project is designed to get you thinking about what God's Word has to say to you at the level of your inside person, what it has to say to you at the level of your heart, the level of your emotions. This is uh, an opportunity for you to make yourself available to God so that He can counsel you. A personal ministry from His heart to your heart. So the idea is to choose a counselling problem that you would anticipate being difficult for you in the task of encouraging and caring for others. As you think about being involved in the lives of others, what do you think there is about you that might get in the way of that task being effective, that ministry being effective? There's a, a certain degree of self-knowledge, self-awareness, self-understanding. If you're having trouble coming up with what that might be, this um, self-counselling project guideline I've handed out gives you lots of good pointers about how to begin to identify what that issue or problem might be. Again, if you have trouble identifying the problem that might be difficult for you to encourage others, I encourage you to ask the person closest to you in your life, what do you see in my life that you anticipate would make it difficult for others to respond to me and receive my counsel? What is it about, about the way I relate? What is it about my attitudes? What is it about me? Is there anything that you can discern, you can put your finger on that would help me identify what blockage there might be in the way I live my life that would make it difficult for others to receive my counsel? You may never have asked your spouse that question. What's it like to have me as a husband? What's it like to have me as a wife? Now, it sounds terrifying, but you see, this is what, this is what it means to be able to encourage one another. It means to be able to get to the level of where we, where we really live and where we really relate and to be honest with ourselves so that we can be honest with others. If we're not prepared to do that inner work in our own hearts, how can we possibly do that work in the life of another? Describe the difficulty and or the discomfort this problem presents to you. Attempt to determine the source of this difficulty. Again, the self-counseling project will give you some steps to work through. This is your effort to be aware of how your personal history could impact on your own counseling ministry. The project will be confidential to your lecturer, that's me, and this project will be handed in when you sit your exam on April the 5th. So, first course requirement, self-counselling project. Second course requirement, the reading response papers. We'll, we'll give you the readings in a moment, but um, what we're looking for here is that after you've completed each reading, you write a response paper to the reading. This should be both an appreciative and critical reflection of what you have read. Begin with a brief summary of the reading in your first paragraph, then spend the rest of your response demonstrating that you've interacted with the contents as to the impact on your heart as you've learnt new ideas or been reminded of old ones. So what we're looking for here is that as a result of these readings, what's going on in your heart as a result of these readings? Are they boring? Are they irrelevant? Are they life-changing? Are they teaching you new things about yourself? Are they teaching you new things about other people and about what it means to have a ministry of encouragement in the body of Christ? Now the readings consist of two books plus some uh, uh, articles, magazine articles. So as a guide for your reading response papers, uh, two pages for a book, one and a half line spacing on a computer, and one page for a selected reading. <coughs> These response papers will be stapled together and handed in when you sit your exam. Uh, the exam, there will be a one hour exam, uh, April 5, requiring short written answers to questions on subjects covered in class lectures. Now, if you look at the weighting there, 40, 40, 20, you see the weighting is not on the exam. The exam is a necessary, exams are a necessary part of the learning process. Without an exam, you won't make the effort to learn the material. That's just a given. If there's no exam, you'll read the material on the night that it's given, on Thursday night, then you'll shelve it and say, it's great, I'll refer to that one day. And, and you build up, you know, a course of all your lectures, and you've got no reason to look at them again until there's an exam. exam will force you to go back to the material and look at it again, you see, part of the learning process. Pure joy. Now, but you notice, you see the exam's only 20%. That means that when it comes to this subject, what's really required for you to be an effective pastoral counsellor is not to be able to pass exams, but to you, for you to be able to do effective internal work in your own heart. So the readings and the response, pa uh, the self-counselling project and the reading response papers are designed to get you to take an inside look into your own heart. 
and to begin to know and understand some things about yourself that perhaps those closest to you have understood for a long time. So hence the waiting you see is on the self-counselling project and on the reading response paper. Over the page, here's the reading requirements. There's two books plus a reading package, so I'm going to hand these books out now. And um, So these two books uh, to be read in the course of this term with a reading response paper of uh, two pages for each book. Um, uh, Blame it on the brain is probably a foundational text for us to understand the link between what goes on in our hearts and what goes on in our thoughts, behaviours and emotions. Uh, Understanding People by Larry Crabb, uh, Why We Long for a Relationship. You'll appreciate that the field of counselling is very wide and very diverse. The field of Christian counselling is no less wide and diverse. The thing about counselling is that not only Christians do it, non-Christians counsel as well. So non-Christians are saying lots of things about counselling. And Christians are interacting with a lot of that information and material and trying to make sense of it all. For instance, if this was a class on preaching, it would be much simpler. Because the non-Christians don't preach. They're not interested in preaching. So we just have the field all to ourselves. Not true when it comes to counselling. We don't have the field all to ourselves. So it's, um, we, we're just going to have to do a lot of reading. There's no way around it. We have to be able to read and, and read around the subject and over the subject and under the subject and through the subject in order to understand what our counselling position should be for our own lives and for our own ministry. Now, Larry Crabb, present, he's a Christian counsellor. He presents a view of counselling which approximates what we do here in this course, but doesn't exactly um, identify with it. So it's designed just to give you an understanding of someone who is a very, very popular author. Most Christians who have any interest in counseling know about Larry Crabb, and you'll be asked the question, well, are you familiar with Larry Crabb? Have you read any of Larry Crabb? What do you think about Larry Crabb? Do you counsel the way Larry Crabb counsels, you see? So, so uh, now as you read Larry Crabb, and as you read the other book by Ed Welsh, and as you read these articles, you see, you'll be you'll be um, uh, thinking and critiquing and talking among yourselves and deciding where are these people uh, uh, helpful and where are they less helpful. Okay, so those are the books. Now I'll hand it. Well, <clears throat> there's no way around it, guys. We just have to do lots of reading in order to get, order to, get to grips with the subject. Uh, but it will give you a very good um, introduction to the field of biblical counselling. So you should all have two books and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven articles. Well, there on the there um, underneath the reading requirements is the course outline, and uh, for the ten weeks of the term, culminating in an exam at the end of the term. Okay. Now, uh, does anyone have any? questions or comments about course requirements, what we've said thus far. No no specific order, no. Just have all your response papers done by the end of the term, by week 10. Um, now, just let me say again, the, the reading is not, is not difficult. It's reading which, uh, well... <laughs> It's all right for me, I guess, to be able to say that. But uh, it's, it's not reading which is um, uh, complex or technical, but it's reasonably straightforward. It's dealing with issues and concerns that are familiar to us every day of our lives. But it will get you thinking about what's going on in your own heart and what's going on in the hearts of other people. Any other comments or questions? about the biblical requirements. I'm going to just hand out now a, uh, a page on definitions, definitions that we're going to be using in this course, and um, we'll just go through it together.
I think, uh, let's see, have I given away my one? Can I borrow one of yours? Thank you. Okay, these are definitions as understood in the context of this course. Now, some of these definitions you're going to, to come across in your readings. Um, and there, a lot of these things are understood in different ways by different people in the field of counselling, Christian and non-Christian. But this is how we're going to approach it here. So I'll just go through these with you. Uh, this is a two-hour course. We'll stop after an hour and have a break. Um, and... Uh, and then we'll continue for another hour and be finished um, by uh, 9 o'clock. That's the plan. Start at 7, finish at 9. The first definition there is pastoral or Christian counselling or therapy. Now, I'm using the word pastoral and Christian interchangeably here on this course when we talk about anything that's pastoral counselling. We're talking about Christian counselling. When we're talking about counselling, we're talking about therapy. Therapy is a, is a word that's used in replace of counselling. It depends on what your qualifications are and whether you've got a doctorate or not mm -hmm. as to whether you engage in therapy or counselling. But uh, in terms of a definition, pastoral or Christian counselling or therapy is person-to-person -person heart talk within the body of Christ that is grace-orientated, gospel-focused, Christ-centred, either formal or informal, planned or spontaneous, can be practiced by any wise, reflective, and sensitive Christian who has the goal of seeing others changing into the image of Christ. So here you are. You're after church on Sunday morning. You're having a cup of tea, and you say to someone, uh, how was your week? And they say, well, actually, it was a very tough week. And then they stop. And they're waiting for your response to that. And you were hoping that they would just say, well, I'm fine frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and exhausted. I'm fine, you see? And that would be the end of the conversation and, and not going any deeper, not getting anything uncomplicated or nasty or uncomfortable. We can continue putting on our plastic Sunday smiles and go home and have a happy lunch. You see, but if they say to you, well, actually, I've had a really tough week, what are you going to do with that? Well, hopefully by the end of this course, you'll know what to do with that. But whatever you do with that, the idea is to be able to respond in such a way that as a result of that conversation and perhaps further conversations, that person is greatly encouraged in the things of Christ. They have a way forward in their difficulty, whatever it is. They have hope, they have light, and as a result of your intervention in their lives, they're going to be better able to help others. Now, you are doing counselling right there. It's spontaneous, it's informal, and it's what can be practiced by any wise and reflective Christian. Now, for instance, they might say, well, look, I've had a really tough week, and you might say something like, I'm sorry to hear that. I'd like to hear more. Would you like to tell me what's been going on? See, in a, in a soft and empathetic and invitational sort of a voice. You wouldn't say, sounds like you need to spend more time with the Lord. So, as a result of your soft and invitational approach, they, they might burst into tears, or they might say, well, can we talk privately? Or they just might launch right into it. That, um, you know, they had a frightful row with their husband or with their wife, and the upshot of the row this week was the other threatened to leave. And I don't know if he or she is going to see a lawyer this week. I just don't know. Now, it may not be as dramatic as that. It might just be, well, you know, I'd, I'm having a real problem with my teenage daughter. She just won't keep curfew, and she won't tell us what she's up to, and we're not. We're, we're worried about the kind of people that she's hanging out with. Now, <clears throat> as you respond to that, you're doing therapy. You're doing counselling. You're doing the one another ministry of personal encouragement that the Bible instructs every Christian to be involved in. Now, you may, you may talk for about 10 minutes, and then they have to go, or family members waiting for them in the car park, you know how it is, and, and or other people are around, and it's getting a bit sensitive, and other people can hear, and it's not a safe place. And, and, and so you're thinking, hmm, this sounds quite serious, and, and it would be nice to continue this conversation. So you might say to this person, well, look, this all sounds, this all sounds very difficult for you, and it seems like... You're, you're struggling with this and it's been very helpful to hear you talk about it. I understand a whole lot more now what's going on and I'll certainly pray for you. But would you, 
would you like to meet for coffee this week and we can pick up on this and talk about it some more? See, and they might say, nah, it's fine. Talking has really helped. Or they, and so that's it, see? You put the invitation out there, it's all you need to do. Or they might say, well, that'd be great. Boy, it really is good to have someone to talk to. Yes, I would really like that. So you meet them for coffee up in the gardens, you see, you know, as they do, and, and, and you spend another hour with them, and you pick up where you left off on Sunday morning. You see what you're doing? Spontaneous, informal, just caring for another believer. Now, you might end up having coffee up there every week for say a period of three or four weeks and over the period of that time you talk through the issues and you talk through the options and you talk through the way forward and you bring in the comfort of the, of the promises of Christ and the gospel and that person is greatly helped. See anybody can do it, right? Especially people who have done this course. Now um, it may be that if you're in a different kind of a situation, you might have, uh, uh, if you're a pastor, for instance, or a pastoral care worker in a church, you might have a designated space. You might have an office. You might have appointments and uh, where you see people. Well, that's a little less informal. That's more formal. That's not quite as spontaneous. It's a bit more organized. But you see, wherever it is on that spectrum, it's all pastoral counseling. It's all heart-to-heart, person-to-person therapy within the body of Christ. That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about secular therapy. We're not talking about the kind of therapy that uh, Christian counselors use who are not interested in using the Bible. You can jump in at any time and ask a question about any of this as we're going through it. The second definition there is a pastoral Christian counselor, helper, or therapist. I'm using all those words interchangeably. <coughs> So a counsellor or a helper or a therapist is someone who does counselling or someone who does therapy, one who is willing to grow and develop in his or her ability to assist others in the process of moving towards personal growth and change in the areas of behaviour, thoughts and feelings within both the biblical framework and the body of Christ. Now that defines you guys. You are here tonight because you are willing to grow and develop in your ability to assist others in the process of moving towards personal growth. Why else would you be here? Why would you give up an evening, a precious evening during the week? Unless it's because you're willing to grow and develop in your ability to help another person towards personal growth and change in behavior, thoughts, and feelings within a biblical framework in the body of Christ. Now, in this course, because most of what we're going to be talking about is orientated towards church life, we're going to be using the word helper to describe what you will be doing. So we're going to help you here in this course to become helpers. And so we'll use the term helper rather than counsellor or therapist. Counsellor and therapist carries a lot of secular baggage, outside of the church baggage, and often not that helpful can be confusing. So we're going to use the word helper. But however, in your readings, you may find authors using these other words like counsellor or therapist, but you know what they're talking about. It's just helper. So you're going to be helpers, willing to grow and develop. Well... <clears throat> The seeker. Uh, the seeker is one who desires personal growth and change and who actively pursues help and engagement towards this end. The seeker is the one who is looking for your help. So helper and seeker. So as helpers, you will go out and you will end up talking to seekers or people who desire personal growth and change and who actively pursue help and engagement. Now, you see, you've asked them. You've asked them there at church over a cup of tea, how was your week? Well, it was, um, it, was, uh, it was a tough week. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Would you like to tell me a bit more about that? You see, you're inviting them to be a seeker. You're inviting them to tell you, to tell you what's going on in their lives in order to seek your comfort and involvement. Now, in the non-Christian world, the seeker is usually referred to as the client. We're not going to use that terminology. We're going to use the terminology of helper and seeker. Here's another definition, spiritual director or spiritual guide or spiritual mentor. There, is, um, there are a lot of Christians, well, in the field of counseling, there are Christians who, who set themselves up as spiritual directors. You may, you may know some of them. They, uh, they advertise, they do courses, and uh, they seek, that's one who seeks to grow and develop in his or her ability to assist others to find God's path in their lives. A spiritual guide or spiritual mentor or spiritual director or someone who is 
concerned primarily with your relationship with God. And so if you come up with a problem, rather than talking with you about the problem, they'll talk with you about how's your relationship with God in the midst of this problem. So it's quite a specific and focused area of concern. In, uh, in this course, what we'll end up doing is, is uh, making spiritual directors out of all of you as, you as you learn to talk both about the issue and about where God fits into the issue. But that is a specialised form of counselling that some people do. Psychology. Psychology is a branch of science that studies behaviour, thoughts and feelings in an attempt to establish a theory of personality. Uh, so psychology uh, primarily began, began with Sigmund Freud and it was Freud who developed the, uh, his personality theories and he came up with personality Personality is a Freudian concept. He came up with personality to ascribe and identify the differences and explain the differences between people. And out of that came this branch of science that studies thoughts and behaviours and feelings and attempt to establish personality identity. So it works something like this. If you get a whole lot of people together like this, and this is what the social sciences do, they study people, and you notice within this group of people Here's some people that exhibit these kinds of characteristics. Here's some people that exhibit these kinds of characteristics. These people over here exhibit these kinds of characteristics. In fact, they're all different. So group one, their characteristics of how they respond to situations, how they respond in relationships, uh, what kind of emotional responses they have to the world around them. You see, they, they, the people in group one all tend to respond in a similar fashion. People in group two all tend to respond in a similar fashion, but it's different from group one. So they observe these differences in people, and so they, um, in order to help talk about these differences, they put labels on these differences. So they might call these ones uh, uh, melancholic, or they might call these ones extroverted, or they might call these ones introverted, and so on. There's about 400 different um, personality labels. They're all out there. So. And then you come to say, well, uh, where do I fit in? <laughs> Which one, one am I on here, you see? And, and what happens is, while the label has, um, has identified those characteristics, it hasn't explained or accounted for those characteristics. But what's happened with, uh, in the field of psychology is that personality has become determinative. Personality has become like blue eyes. You're born with blue eyes and you can never change your blue eyes the rest of your life. You're born extroverted, end of story, you'll be extroverted the rest of your life. You see, you're born with a certain personality trait. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. So rather than trying to understand behavior, thoughts, and feelings in terms of theories of personality, we're going to understand behaviors, thoughts, and feelings in terms of how the Bible describes them, looking at the labels the Bible uses and the descriptions the Bible uses to account for it. So um, you, asked this, you asked this lady on Sunday morning, how are things this week? And she said, well, you know, uh, not too bad. Uh, uh, sorry, not, no, not going too well. And you ask her and she says, well, um, my husband just gets so angry with the kids all the time. And then she says, she kind of shrugs her soul and says, well, I guess he's just an angry man. In other words, anger is just what he is. It's like blue eyes. It's the only way she can account for his anger. She doesn't want to say it's sin because that's not being unkind. She doesn't want to blame the kids. She doesn't want to blame her husband. doesn't want to lose her relationship with her husband. So I guess that's just the way he is. And implication, I guess we'll just have to learn to live with the fact that he's an angry man and some things just trigger him and off he goes. Well, that's not how the Bible would deal with her husband. But you see how a theory of personality has conditioned us to just accept what we see in people's lives without necessarily feeling the Bible has anything to say about it. So that's psychology. Psychotherapy is any systematic methodology based on some theory of personality intended to achieve desirable <coughs> changes in the thinking, feeling, and behavior. More than 400 different systems of psychotherapy have been identified. 
So psychotherapy is the method you use if you, uh, in order to bring about personality change in people's lives. Um, that definition comes from the Dictionary of Psychology, which is down there in our library. Now, <clears throat> what, the psycho, what, what psychotherapy seeks to do, here's someone whose behavior is uh, unacceptable, the way they're responding to life is unacceptable, so we're going to counsel with them or do therapy with them, and our purpose is to unearth their personality so that they become more aware of their personality and then seek through their cooperation to bring some changes in their personality so they become different kind of people. Now you see what's driving that? Personality determines our thoughts, behaviors, and emotions. If we can bring changes at the level of the personality, we will change people. And uh, for the last 120 years, that's been uh, the um, approach of Freudian psychotherapy and the conclusion that many people are coming to today is that it doesn't work. Well, the Christian's not surprised it doesn't work. It doesn't work because people don't change. And, what, and it's driven in America by the um, private health insurers. The private health insurers got sick of paying out for 40 sessions of psychotherapy and there was no change. So they said, no, this is no good, this doesn't work. We're looking for quick results and verifiable results. And so, to a large extent, there's a feeling out there that therapy doesn't work because psychotherapy doesn't work. It's no use talking about your problems. We have to find other ways to help people to change. And how do we do that? Through drug therapy. And so most of the research now has moved away from dealing with theories of personality into uh, synthetic drugs, psychotropic drugs, in order to bring about quick change in people's behaviors, thoughts, and emotions. And uh, so you get a drug like Prozac. Now, Prozac works for 90% of the population. If you take Prozac, you'll feel better. Therefore, there must have been something wrong with you, right? Because Pro Prozac is fixing it. So the drug therapy now is where uh, is replacing talking therapy. Now, is there a place for, for drugs in Christian counseling? Yes, there is. There's certainly a place for antidepressants. There's certainly a place for uh, mood stabilizers. There's certainly a place for um, drugs for people who suffer uh, uh, different aspects of autism and so on. There is a place for it. Uh, and we will talk about that. But just to note in passing what the, the big shifts over the last 50 years has been away from psychotherapy and toward drug therapy. However, so what we're doing here is considered very, very uh, old-fashioned, almost out of date and abnormal. You mean you still think you can just talk to people and see change come about? Well, yes, because it's not the talking. It's the gospel. And if it's gospel-orientated talking and grace-filled talking, then long-lasting life change will eventuate. A psychotherapist is one who practices psychotherapy. A psychotherapist is one who seeks through the art of a healing conversation to interact with the behaviors, thoughts, and feelings of another in order to achieve desirable change. Now that's different from a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is a physician who specializes in the diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and study of mental and emotional disorders. They use a medical model that relies mainly on the prescribing of psychiatric drugs. A psychiatrist is like a doctor a doctor of the mind, not a doctor of the body. Now, we're not going to be doing a whole lot with those um, psychotherapy, psychology, and psychiatry in the course of, of uh, our program here, but just to, um, uh, just to be aware, you'll, these will come up in your, in your readings. Secular theories and therapies. These are ways of understanding and helping people that do not have their presuppositions, methodology, or outcomes determined by the scriptures. Uh, if we're thinking about um, we're thinking about uh, helping people, helping people to deal with their problems, helping people to change, we begin with a presupposition, which leads to a methodology, which leads to an outcome. Now, here's a person who has a problem with anger, okay? And, and, and we're going to help this person with their problem with anger. Now, what's the outcome we're looking for? Well, we want an outcome where this person is responding in their relationships, not with anger, but with patience, love, forbearance, grace, mercy, tenderness, kindness, all biblical words, no? Biblical words that go on and on and on. See, we could list them here. 
all these biblical words. See, a very desirable outcome for an angry person. If that's the outcome we want, what method are we going to use to get that person to this point? Well, I don't know, you tell me. What do you do with an angry person? Do you tolerate? Do you enable? See, the wifey shrugs her shoulders and, said, and says, I guess that's just the way he is. She is an enabler. She is enabling his anger to continue. I sometimes say to, uh, <coughs> to wives who have these kinds of relational problems, nothing will change in your relationship until you make it impossible for the status quo to continue. Anything less than that, you know, and she's a neighbor. So what are we going to do? What method are we going to use? Are we going to <coughs> use Bible verses? Are we going to uh, seek to convict of sin? Well, whatever method we use is going to be determined by our presuppositions. Presuppositions give rise to methodology. Methodology give rise, gives rise to outcome. Now, what we usually do is we begin at this end, see? With the desired outcomes, then we go backwards. And whatever method we think will work, we'll adjust our presuppositions accordingly. Now, if your presuppositions is that only the Bible and the Gospel can bring long-lasting life change, if that's your presupposition, that will determine your methodology and it will determine your outcome. If only the Bible brings about long-lasting life change, LLLC, See, long-lasting life change. If only the Bible brings long-lasting life change. What is the change that the Bible wants to see? Well, we listed all our biblical terms here. So what methodology will link our presupposition with our outcome? Now, secular theories and therapies of counseling have different presuppositions from what we will have in this course. Even though, at times, their methodology may look similar, and at times, their outcomes may look similar. With an angry person... A Christian counsellor wants that person to change so they become kind and gentle and patient. Well, a non-Christian counsellor will want exactly the same outcome for that angry person. So the outcome may look very similar, but that doesn't mean to say their methodology is the same or their presuppositions are the same. So when you're reading a secular counsellor, for instance, and they're describing a situation that a person suffers from, some emotional disorder of some kind, maybe it's depression, um, maybe it's uh, some kind of mood disorder, and they're describing it, and they're describing the outcomes that they want, they're, they're, it's, going to sound, it's going to sound very much like what we would want. For instance, when it comes to anger, the non-secular method of anger often is what they call anger management. So the person will be sent off to an anger management course. And if that fails, they'll try something else. But you see, what's the presupposition behind anger management methodology? Okay, just expand on that, Your Honour. Um, okay. So what is, what's anger management? What is anger management try to do with an angry person? What does it try to teach them? They use the tools to manage okay. The they give them techniques on how to manage their anger. Give them techniques on how to respond when they had a situation that triggers their anger. To manage their anger and to redirect their anger into more productive directions. The presupposition that lies behind that is that the angry person has the resources within themselves to deal with the anger problem. And as the, as the helper, your job is to help them connect with whatever internal resources they have and help them to do a better job of managing their anger. You see, the presupposition is different. The method is different, though the outcome may look the same. Now, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be looking at our presuppositions and at the methodology that arises from biblical presuppositions. And we want the outcomes to reflect Biblical growth, sanctification, what does it look like to become more and more like Jesus Christ? That's the outcome. So secular theories and therapies are ways of understanding and helping people that do not have their presuppositions, methodology, or outcomes determined by the scriptures. In GTC's counseling program, we will teach you about the secular theories and therapies. 
Now that won't be in this course. If you stay and do the whole program, you'll get that in another course called um, Counseling and Psychotherapy. Oh, sorry, Counseling and Psychology. We'll teach you the secular theories and therapies, but we will not train you to use them because they're bankrupt. Rather, we will help and train you to develop a biblical modality and approach to helping people grow and change, as it says in the definition at the top of the page. A modality or a method which is grace oriented, gospel focused, Christ centered. Okay? Well, any thoughts or comments about um, any of those definitions? Anything you'd like to ask about those definitions? Well, there is a sense in which every, every theory of counselling, every Christian theory of counselling, is tainted with sin and fallenness and fallibility. Uh, so we have to always be reforming our methodology. We always have to be re-examining again our presuppositions and our methodology in order to achieve those biblical outcomes. So whatever method you come across, even the one here, in this course uh, needs to be continually critiqued and understood in the light of scripture. Now some of the readings you're going to do will help you to do that and some of the things we talk about here will help you to do that. Okay, anything else anyone would like to say thus far about anything we've talked about? What's the temperature like in here? Should we it's getting a bit hot? Yeah, definitely. There is a um, um, there's a humility here that's required of us because we, of all people involved in the helping business, uh, know our limitations. We know that uh, we too are dependent on Christ and His Word. We know that our own sinfulness is there and gets in the way. We're very aware of our limitations, so that produces humility. Yet with that humility comes a confidence in knowing that because we have a methodology and presuppositions grounded in the scriptures, we with confidence can speak into people's lives. Well, as you think about uh, all that we've said thus far, what's your feeling about this course? Is this something that, with fear and trembling, you could take on? Or is it something you could jump into, boots and all, singing and shouting for joy? What are your thoughts and comments? Because by the end of the evening, I'd like you all to hand in your enrollment forms, those of you who have got them, and have your little credit circle ticked at the top there. That would be my desire. It may not be your desire. It may not be the Lord's desire. So what are, just give me some feedback here thus far. Is this, is this more than what you expected? Is it less than what you expected? Is this more technical? Is it more theoretical? Is it more what? So in terms of the class, um, it, it, 
the reality is that uh, a lot of it is going to revolve once you've got the concepts, but you're going to obviously have to interact with people. And my observation of dealing with people is that there's a real art of being able to draw people out and being wise and all those sorts of things. I mean, did, in this course, did we get a chance to? I wonder if it were like role play to get applied principles rather than just sort of learn a whole lot of theories, or is that, where does, how does that all sort of pan out? You'll see in your course outline there that role plays uh, kick in on week nine. And what we've done there, we've allowed the whole two hours for role plays. Um, right. But there may, be, there may be opportunity to do role plays uh, as we go along. Um, now, what we're going to be doing, we're going to have lots of real life illustrations to illustrate what we're talking about. And uh, you, will, uh, you will, as what often happens in a course like this, um, the classroom experience itself becomes quite therapeutic. As you listen to the lectures, as you do the readings, you find that things have been stirred up in your own heart. Uh, so it becomes very applicable from that point of view. You begin to come to a greater self-awareness of what is there in my heart and in my life and the way that I live and the way that I relate that's getting in the way of me being able to help others. Also, you'll have opportunity in, in, the, uh, in this term and in the next term when we look more specifically at different issues in people's lives, you'll have opportunity to begin to put them to practice. You see, just just in the matter of living. Uh, those of you are married will put it into practice with your spouses and you'll start to talk to each other and listen to each other in new and different ways about what's going on in your hearts, in each other's hearts, you see? And you'll have the opportunity to do that with people at church and, and just developing some listening skills and to start listening in a way that really blows the mind of the people that know you well. Wow, I never knew you could listen like that. That is amazing, you see? So it's... Uh, the application, to some extent, is up to you, and uh, the application will be there all the way through. Now, next term, you'll have a specific project designed to actually go and approach someone and talk to them about an issue in their life. Right now, it's a self-counseling project, this term, to look at your own stuff. We'll also talk about um, uh, how to ask questions and the kind of questions to ask people in order to move them through to an understanding of their issues in the light of the gospel. Two ten week terms. Might? Your wife's sitting there going, Yes. <laughs> At last, I got him here. <laughs> Do you like to talk some more about that? <laughs> <laughs> is this a role play? Or is yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is real life, brother. This is rubber meets the road stuff. So, uh, yes, I mean, you just should expect that. This, it, will, it will have a therapeutic effect on your lives. Um, now, just on that, we should also say at the outset that we need to maintain um, confidentiality with one another inside this classroom. In other words, you see, we need to create a safe environment for one another right here in this class so, so that you feel safe sharing about struggles you're having in your own heart as you interact with this material and you interact with life and, and to feel safe and confident to be able to share that knowing that all of us here will respect what you have to say, including Hans over there, you see? So that nothing, nothing that we hear here will be repeated by us outside that door. So even, even be careful when you're having a cup of tea at break time, kind of engaging someone in something that they talked about here. Just, just be aware of that. It just might not be a safe environment for them. Um, now, you see, this is already, you see the learning has begun. As you, be, as you offer the blessing of confidentiality to one another, a safe place in which to be real about your lives, see, you're learning what it means to have confidential conversations with people in your church. And to be aware of the fact that if you ask somebody that question on Sunday morning and they begin to share some stuff, you are aware as the helper or the potential helper, you are aware of the confidentiality issues that are all around you at that very moment. This person, the seeker or the potential seeker, is so caught up in what they're saying, they're so excited that someone will actually listen to them 
without looking at their watch and wanting to get away, you see, that, that they'll, they'll tend to forget that there's people all around and then, and then and you have to be aware of that and, and, and perhaps say some things which shows that you're sensitive enough to those issues of confidentiality and things that are personal. So if we can do that for one another, that will uh, really help us. Yes, Eden. How does that work? Just Pardon? How does the confidentiality work? Just being oh, sorry, I didn't hear the last bit. How does the confidentiality work? Just being recorded? Oh. That's right. <laughs> Maybe Hans will have to edit that out. No, that's very good. That's very good. We'll, um, yeah, we'll ask Hans to edit that out. Yes, Erina. Um, <laughs> well, one thing we're going to learn very early on is that pastoral counselling is not about giving advice um, uh, on that issue of um, seeker, seeker resistance if you like um, they're, they're, uh, uh, you've, you've, uh, they've said to you let's build that scenario Sunday morning over a cup of tea well how was your week well it was pretty tough actually well I'm sorry to hear that would you like to tell me about it? Uh, no, not really. Um, then, see, it could be a matter of timing. It could be a matter of place. This is not, they don't feel this is a good place to talk about it. It just might be a matter of timing. They're not ready to talk about it. If it's a situation where someone is um, uh, acting out in a sinful manner and you want to be able to speak to them in a way that gets them to change and you strike uh, resistance from them, then it could well be that, uh, again, it's not the right time for them. You know, the Holy Spirit would totally depend on the Holy Spirit opening up hearts and, and making people ready for change. We really need to pray that the Holy Spirit will bring that time about in that person's life. And it also could be that our approach needs to be modified in order for that person to feel confident and encouraged. So there's two issues there. There's really the sin issues in their own lives, which we're dependent on God to do about and how we're approaching it. Now, as, see, as pastoral counsellors, we don't give advice, and it's not our job to convict of sin. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict of sin. Wow, what a relief. We can leave that with him. That'd help a lot of marriages, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, any other comments you'd like to make about the course itself and the course requirements and the load? Is this, is this manageable? Okay, good man. Well, look, let's take a break. <laughs> good evening, all you out there in Radio Land. Uh, we're going to do a lecture now on biblical foundations for pastoral counselling. Uh, our first one, if you notice in the course outline, we have two lectures on biblical foundations. Here's the first one. Usually these lectures take two hours. We have one hour. We'll uh, zip through it. Well, less than one hour. Uh, now, the way this is the way I do my lecturing. I give you a, a, a full copy of the lecture notes. Here they are here. And uh, I go through them, and I might add to them as we go through. Draw some diagrams on the board, uh, <coughs> fill in with some other comments. And what, what I encourage you to do is to be active <laughs> rather than passive, an active listener. In other words, you have a pen poised, and you get ready to take notes uh, from what, what you hear me say. Um, and those notes will be the things that you think about, the things that strike you, the things that seem to be important to you. So at the end of the lecture, you'll have my notes and you'll have your notes. And together, they will, have, uh, they will represent uh, what, you, uh, what you've been taught and what you've gained and accessed for yourself that the Holy Spirit has laid on your heart. So I'd encourage you to um, be active in that regard. 
Okay, uh, five unavoidable facts. Someone in your church had a problem this week. That's an unavoidable fact. Might even have been you. That's an unavoidable fact. Someone in your church had a problem this week. We're sinful people living in a sinful world. We sin, we sin against others, and we are sinned against. Someone in your church had a problem this week. Second unavoidable fact, we have everything we need in the gospel to help them. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. I'd encourage you to uh, bring Bibles to class and, and look up these verses as we go through them. Um, I'll give you time to find them. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 2 uh, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Saviour our Lord His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness Everything we need for life and godliness comes through our knowledge of Him Our knowledge of Him comes through Revelation the Bible through the Holy Spirit, through the Scriptures. That is our knowledge of Him. And that knowledge we have of Him is sufficient for everything we need in life and godliness. So you as a believer, as a Christian, as one indwelt by the Holy Spirit, whose sins have been saved, who are trusting Jesus for your salvation, you have everything you need in the Gospel to help them. Wow. If that's the only thought you go home with tonight, that'll, be, that'll bring about long-lasting life change. You have everything. You don't need to be me standing up here. You have everything you need in the gospel to help them. Third unavoidable fact. This person who had a problem this week will seek help first from family and friends. If they seek help at all, they'll go people to people they know well, family and friends. Family or friends. Maybe there's no friends in their family, but they'll go to friends. And when they go... Fourth unavoidable fact, they will get either no help, bad help, or biblical gospel-centered help. Fifth, five, whatever help they get, they will use to help others. Now, someone had a, <clears throat> someone had a problem in your church this week. Uh, you have everything you need to help them. So what we're going to do is talk about how to connect you, who has everything you need to help them in the gospel, how to connect you with that person that had the problem. And a lot of it will be just the way you live your life within the church and the confidence that your grace-filled Christian living inspires in those that struggle. So that you might be one of those they come to seek help from and that from you they will get gospel-centered help which they will then use to help others. That will change our churches, wouldn't it? Change our families within our churches. Hence, for our help to be useful and God-honoring, we must have a biblical foundation and framework for our counseling. We are Christians, counseling within a biblical framework. The scriptures are to have a regulating authority in our lives, not just to provide commentary, but reshape the knowledge we glean from the examination and observation of general revelation. General revelation includes people. People are part of God's creation. We know that the creation says some things reveals some things about God. When you get to know people, that reveals some things to you about God, if nothing else than that God was right. And when he described people like this, you see, it reaffirms for you the truth of God's word, just getting to know people. There's no help for this person apart from the gospel. There's no help for my relationship unless somehow we can be reconciled around Christ. You see, the, the, the encounter we have with fellow creatures, created creatures, general revelation, tells us that God's word is true. But you see, we want God's word to do more than just provide commentary on life. We want God's word to do more than just simply say, uh, that person is bad, that person needs to repent, that person needs to love more, that's providing commentary. 
We, the Bible needs to do more than that. The Bible needs to reshape our knowledge of people and of people's situations and problems. To do that, the Bible must first reshape our own understanding of ourselves and the way we respond to problems and issues in our relationships. 99% of the problems people have are to do with relationships. They're relational problems. How do we get on in our relational issues? Are we allowing the scriptures to reshape the way we do relationships? Are we allowing the scriptures to continue to reshape the way we do relationships? Is the Bible simply a commentary we look to from time to time, or is it having a reshaping influence in our own lives? That's what it means to ha for the Bible to have a regulating authority in our lives. When God speaks, we make application, and then we change. Uh, from the book of Romans, we see that the natural man, that's the non-Christian man or woman, knows that God exists, knows God's moral law and God's sanctions, yet at the very same time, his or her response is to actively suppress this knowledge, exchange the truth of God for a lie, live wickedly, and applaud wickedness in others. Now, all of that is in Romans chapter 1. You can, you can look at that uh, in your own time in between readings. <laughs> you can dig out Romans chapter 1 and follow that through. You see that, that progression? It ends up with uh, uh, applauding wickedness in others, and it begins with knowing God's moral law and God's sanctions, yet at the same time actively suppressing this knowledge. Exchanging the truth of God for light, living wickedly and applauding wickedness in others. This is indeed foolish living, and this is what you will see as a helper. You will see evidence of foolish living. You will see evidence of wicked living. You will see evidence of people exchanging the truth of God for lie. You will see evidence of people actively suppressing their knowledge of God and His law. You will see people who applaud wickedness in others in some way, shape, or form. You will see variations of all of that as you seek to step into people's lives. As you step into their world, as you step into their life, as you step into their heart, everything in Romans 1 will surface and focus in some way, shape or form. Once you start getting in on the inside of people's lives, this is what you can expect to find as Romans 1 describes people. Now, self-counseling project, as you begin to get inside your own heart, Horror of horrors. This is what you can expect to find. Because the Romans 1 description includes you and me. Now, see, here's where we need... Um, let's see. Everyone here is married. Here's where we need the encouragement and comfort of a loving and godly spouse. As we start to dig around in our own hearts and we are horrified at what we see and we cry out to God for mercy and forgiveness and we cry out to those around us who we have sinned against horribly and we've only just realized how badly we've sinned against them and we seek their mercy and their forgiveness so change takes place now here's the thing if we never get to that point in our own lives please don't try to help others you'll only do them damage you'll only do them damage you will not be a safe person to seek help from if you haven't done that work in your own heart. Romans 1 describes our hearts. Okay, uh, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3 and then we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 2. So let's go to Colossians chapter 3, looking at biblical foundations for pastoral counselling. And I'm going to read some verses here. From Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to read um, verses 1 to 17. Now I've left gaps there for you to uh, write notes on the page itself as to fill in as we go along here. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 Since then you have been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God 
Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which has been renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and on all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's come back to the first four verses. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I'm going to put a wee diagram on the board that illustrates these four verses. Here's a timeline. That's, um, that's our timeline. It begins with creation. And uh, into our timeline uh, came Jesus Christ. In the fullness of time, God sent forth a son, born of a woman, born under, born under the law. Now when Jesus Christ came, he introduced for us the eternal age. sometimes spoken of in scripture as uh, eternal, <coughs> eternal life, sometimes spoken of as the kingdom of God, sometimes spoken of as the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus came, he brought with him this eternal kingdom of God. Now Jesus is coming back one day. And when he comes back, he'll bring this timeline to an end. In his first coming, this timeline continued. But when he returns, this timeline will come to an end. And all we'll be left with is the eternal age. That's why there's an arrowhead on it. See, it's eternal. It goes on forever. Now, the scriptures refer to this bottom timeline as this present evil age. And this top one as eternal life or eternal age, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, uh, also referred to as the age to come. All these different terminologies the New Testament used to describe this eternal age that came when Jesus came. Now, you and I are here. We're here in the box. We're people in the box. And what's true of our situation right now is that we participate in this present evil age while also being part of the eternal age. We are in this box, in this world but not of the world, waiting for the time when this evil age will pass away and we will be left simply with the full experience of the eternal age. This is how the Apostle Paul describes it. Since then you have been raised with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. We are with Christ in the heavenlies. We are part of the eternal age. We don't have to wait for the second coming to become part of this eternal age. We are there now. Since then you have been raised. That's past tense. 
with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. These are the things above. Where Christ has ascended to the eternal life, to the kingdom of heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God. Paul says, faith and repentance in Jesus Christ lifts you up to that position and you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. <coughs> Set your minds on things above, on not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So your life is now identified not with the present evil age, your life is identified now with the age to come. This is your life. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is not hidden in this present evil age. So uh, when Christ who is your life appears, you will also appear with him in glory. So verse 4 represents over here. When Christ appears, you will appear with him in glory and the glory of the eternal age will be your full experience without the age to come. So we are people in the box. We are people who live simultaneously in two ages, this present evil age and the eternal age. That describes our situation right now in Christ. Now, when people struggle in their Christian life, it's because they're overwhelmed by this present evil age. And to minister to them effectively the graces of Christ, we have to help them see and live out the age to come rather than this present evil age. I like to call this the already but not yet of Christian living. Already but not yet. See, we've already been raised, but we don't yet have the full experience of eternal life. But we've already been raised. Already but not yet. People who struggle in their Christian life and are overwhelmed by sin are people who are overwhelmed by this present evil age and have forgotten that they have been raised with Christ. There's a new power available because we have been raised with Christ. Now we want to help them appropriate that new power so that in this in the box here, they can live with a changed life, a life that is growing more like Christ all the time in preparation for verse 4. Now, <clears throat> given that that's our position, the Apostle Paul then, in verses 5 to 11, gives these public exhortations for Christian living, uh, all the way down from verse 5 all the way to verse 11. And here he's saying that um, we have the power and we have the life in Jesus Christ. He is our all. He is in all of us and, and we are in all of him. Uh, in verse 11, Christ is all and is in all. Christ is our all and he is in all of us. Therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Now, people read those words and they have no idea how to do that. They have no idea what aspects of their per earthly nature need to be put to death. And even if they did know that, they have no idea how to do that. In other words, how do we take this wonderful truth and in verse 5 put it into action in those areas of our lives that are pulling us away from a life that looks, looks more like Jesus Christ. Now the task of you all as, as pastoral counselors, pastoral helpers, are to help people understand how they could do that how they could put to death whatever belongs to the earthly nature so that long-lasting life change begins to take place. And so verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Here is the life of Jesus. Verse 12 describes the life of Jesus. Jesus was clothed with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And you see, we want, we want this angry husband to be able to put to death his earthly nature and become a man who is clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience because he is one of God's chosen people and dearly loved. You see that in verse 12? 
one of God's pe chosen people and dearly loved. Therefore, you see, he can be clothed in these things. But he doesn't know how. He needs encouragement. He needs help. He needs personal ministry. I like to think of verse 12 as describing the clothes of the pastoral counsellor. When you get up on Sunday morning and you put on your Sunday clothes, you also put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. And you walk out of the house with kindness, humility, gentleness and patience as you're working overalls of the pastoral counsellor going among God's sheep in order to offer Christ-centered encouragement. You go with those working clothes on. And so when you're talking to people over a cup of tea or any time at church, you are talking with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's how you're talking to them. That's how you're relating to them. That's how you're using your words. That's how you're listening. What you're modeling is the life of Christ. And in modeling the life of Christ, what you're saying to that person is, is if, you, if you take the risk of sharing with me what's going on in your life, this is something of what you'll receive in return. You will receive compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Notice that doesn't say that we need to clothe ourselves with the ability to condemn sin wherever we find it in other people, especially in our spouse <coughs> or in our children. That's not the clothe. That's not, the, that's not clothing ourselves with the, with the, clo the clothing of Jesus. Now, you see, having been, having been raised with Christ to the heavenly places, having put to death our earthly nature, having been clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, then we're ready for verse 13. Then we're ready to bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Wow. If we all did that, wouldn't we all be a lot better off? But you see, bearing with one another and forgiving one another won't come without verse 12. It won't come without verse 5. It won't come without verses 1 to 4. In the relationships of everyday life, marriage, family, school, church, work, etc., we bear with one another and we forgive whatever grievances we have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So we step into people's lives with humility, compassion, kindness, gentleness, and patience, and with a willingness to forgive whatever they do to us. With a willingness to forgive whatever they do to us. That's like bringing Jesus into your workplace. Over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. This is the outcome, if you like, that we're looking for in people's lives. People who model Jesus Christ with love, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, verse 15 starts getting personal. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now we're talking about your hearts. Now we're talking about dealing with our own hearts. What are the blockages in our own hearts to peacefulness and thankfulness? Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one another, or, uh, members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. What is it in your heart that stops you being thankful? Stops you being thankful to your, for your spouse? Stops you being thankful for your children? Stops you being thankful for your church that you're in? That stops you being thankful for the people that you work with? That stops you being thankful for your neighbors? What is it that stops you being a joyful and thankful Christian? What is it that's getting in the way of you going into your world as a joyful and thankful Christian? willing to forgive with compassion, humility, and gentleness any who come across your path. What's stopping you doing that? What are the obstacles to you doing that? What is it in your heart that robs you of peace, that causes you to, to, to for anxiety, that causes you to, to not trust people, that causes you to be stirred up about the actions of others, that you can't respond to the sin of others with peace? and with gentleness and with kindness. What is it that prevents you from maintaining a non-anxious presence when someone is sharing a story of suffering and grief? What is it that stops you maintaining a non-anxious presence? What is it that stops you from being able to minister to that person in ways that encourage them and bless them? 
Let me give an example from my own life. Um, when I was a, a young person, school age, I was subject to uh, a lot of bullying over many, many years. And uh, I've still got the scars here in my arms where they held me down and burnt me with cigarette butts. A lot of bullying. And, and, my, and as a result, when I got into my teenage years, I had, um, I had a very bad stammer. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't speak uh, um, a sentence of three or four words. It was just impossible for me. And I went through all my teenage years with this, with this very bad stammer. So um, I wasn't very hopeful about the way my life was turning out. Um, and during that time, I had three older brothers and, and subject to a lot of bullying from them and from others. And um, um, then I, um, I left home and I got into my 20s and my Christian life began to take off and I began to grow spiritually and I began to put all that behind me. I think, well, I'm glad I'm through all that angst of teenage years and my stammer went away and I was able to talk. And uh, then I got into my 30s and I got married and I had a family and, and, and God gave me a ministry. And I thought, wow, this is great. We're on the up and up. We're rocketing here. We had three beautiful children and a uh, beautiful godly wife and the ministry and, and, and all those teenage years were long forgotten. And um, we had a daughter, we had a son and then we had another daughter. Things were just peachy, cruising along. Um, I'm not sure my wife would say that, but from my point of view, things were just going great guns. And then um, uh, uh, my son hit his teenage years. And he began to experience a lot of the same issues that I'd experienced as a teenager. He was subject to bullying, and uh, he, was, um, uh, he was quite shy. He wasn't a strong person within himself, so he wasn't able to stand up for himself, and people took advantage of him. And um, uh, he, um, he and I, uh, our relationship plummeted, and I... Uh, about that time, I started getting some encouragement to look into my own heart to see what was going on. And the reason why I was so angry with him, and the reason I was so angry with him because all his teenage angst was bringing back to me all my teenage angst. And, and I was having to relive my teenage years as I grappled with his teenage years. In other words, I looked at him as a teenager and I was reminded of myself as a teenager and all the grief and all the sadness and all the struggle came flooding back into my own heart. And I was mad with him for so reminding me. He should have had his teenage years just sweet and peaceful and no grief so that I could have kept my teenage years far, the, far back in the background where I thought they were safely laid and buried. He brought them all to life for me. So here were two teenage men in the house, you see, battling with one another. And, and all my angst was getting mixed up in all his angst and, and it was a disaster. One day I said to my daughter, who's just a couple of years bit older than my son, I said to her, um, what's it like to have me as a father? Now, she would have been about 16 at the time, 16, 17. What's it like to have me as a father? We're standing in the kitchen, and uh, you know, you remember these things like they were yesterday. We were standing in the kitchen, and Margaret was there, and Charlotte was there, Charlotte's my daughter, and I said to her, because I'd been encouraged by someone who was trying to help me to reflect on my own heart and to enlist the help of my family members. So I asked Charlotte, what's it like to have me as a father? And I asked the question kind of a little bit lightheartedly, oh, this is just a fun thing to do, and, you know, there's going to be nothing significant in what she has to say, because having me as a father is all light and joy and happiness. And, you know, 17-year-old girl, I mean, she doesn't have any problems, does she? <laughs> and, and, you know, she didn't say anything. She kind of, you know, pretended she was looking at all the magnets on the fridge, you see? And so I asked her again. And um, uh, being the oldest, you know, oldest tends to be a little more out there, don't they? And, and she said, well, Dad, um, I experience you as a very angry man. And she said it kind of, she said it like she was expecting that what she was said would set off a whole lot of anger with me, you see? So it was a little bit, and you know the first thing I said in response, I'm not angry. How dare you think I'm angry? So I said, I'm not angry. And um, she said, yes, you are. So, like every good husband, I turned to my wife for support. <laughs> and said, come on, say something in my defense here. 
tell her that I'm not angry. She looked at me and she said to me, Peter, you better listen to what Charlotte has to say. Wow. At that point, I was all undone. All my resistance was gone. As these two women in my life were talking to me, but you see what she was doing? She was inviting me. It was invitational. She didn't go like this, didn't raise her voice. She just said, I think you should listen to what Charlotte has to say. At that point, I knew I was a duck's dinner. I was a goner, you see? Because, so I listened to what Charlotte had to say, and it was, it was uh, the beginning of a turning point for me. There was a lot of tears on my part and on her part and on Margaret's part, and the conversation went on for a number of days, and uh, there was repentance on my part and having to apologize and asking Charlotte to forgive me. Then I had to go to my son, this, this, this teenage boy that was stirring all this stuff up in me, and we had to sort things out. And by God's grace, we did. And he's, 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 he lives overseas. He's coming home with his wife in a few weeks, and he wrote, and he said, Dad, I want to go tramping with you up in the bush. Can you arrange three days tramping? I just want to spend some time with you. Oh, man, you see? But it begins with looking into your own heart. It begins with allowing people to speak truth into your own hearts. What is it in my heart that's robbing me of peace and thankfulness when it came to my children, when it came to my son? Now, I thought what was robbing me of peace was his behavior. What was robbing me of peace that in my own heart, I didn't have the compassion, the kindness, humility, the gentleness, and the patience to bear with what he was going through. And so I added to his angst rather than providing a way to fall for him. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, beloved. What's going on in our hearts that's robbing us of peace and thankfulness? Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. In other words, if you want to be a pastoral counselor, teaching and admonishing others, then you have to let the word of Christ dwell richly in your heart. If the word of Christ does not dwell richly in your heart, then it won't come out in your counseling, a word that brings life and health and change to those you're talking to. Now, in verse 16, there's the private, personal, and public ministries of the word. The private ministry of the word, let the, <coughs> let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's uh, where you allow the word of God to minister to you on a private basis. That's you allowing the scriptures to minister to you, say quiet time, personal devotions. That's where the word of God is dwelling richly in your heart. And uh, as it dwells richly uh, in you, as, as it dwells richly in you, then you are able to engage in a personal ministry of the word, teaching and admonishing one another. So we have a private ministry of the word, private ministry of the word which is to yourself we have a personal ministry of the word which is to one other one other person and then finally we have a public ministry of the word which is to others as you teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs so as you're as you're singing there in church and the person next to you is singing as you sing you are teaching and admonishing one another through the words that you sing. It's a public ministry of the word we're all having to one another as we sing. And it brings us to verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever, whatever you do in word or deed, that's pretty comprehensive. In other words, these instructions apply to every aspect of our life not just our ministry. <coughs> See, we're not kind and compassionate with those that are struggling that come to us for help, but we're mean, horrible, nasty, and impatient with the people at home and our family. <laughs> I remember once, well, it's funny now, it wasn't funny then, uh, Rebecca was 15, and I was leaving the house in the evening to go and speak to a group of people about parenting. 
biblical aspects of parenting. As I walked out the door, my 15-year-old daughter said, Dad, why don't they get someone who knows what they're talking about? Whew. See, that was ringing in my ears as I climbed on the car. <laughs> 15. What can you do? They're 15. Life hasn't even begun for them, though they know it all. At 15, they're never wrong, right? You see? But nevertheless, you see, I got in the car and I was thinking, you know, there must be something about my parenting that's not connecting with Rebecca. So we talked about it later on. You see, whatever you do, it's all very well to go out and play the ministry role in the counselling or the preaching or the Sunday school teaching or uh, leading women's Bible study or whatever it is. But if it's not everything and whatever you do in word or deed, it's a heart full of peace, it's a heart full of thankfulness, it's the context in life. Now, see, unless I get things sorted out at home, I'll be no good to the people I try to minister to, will I? You're supposed to say, no, you won't be any use at all. Okay. Let's have a look at 1 Thessalonians 2. Um, now the... Uh, We don't have time to read the whole passage. I just want to make a few points here. Um, oops. One Thessalonians two. Paul is describing his ministry to the people in Thessalonica. And um, I'm just going to, uh, you know, I want you to just, uh, as I say the verse, you go to the verse and you tell me how he describes his ministry of the people in Thessalonica. Okay, verse 3. What does he say? Uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Okay. Pure, honest, truthful. Okay, verse 4. How did he describe his ministry in verse 4? Okay. Uh, was that God tested our hearts? I mean, approved by God. Okay, approved by God. Translations may differ here. Uh, verse 5. How does he describe his approach to them? Well, he was open, wasn't he? No masks to cover up hidden sin. Open heart and life. Okay, uh, verse 7. How does he describe his approach? Gentle, Gentle like a mother. Okay, verse 8. How does he describe his approach and his ministry? Michael, verse 8. How does he describe his approach to the Thessalonians? Okay, he loved them and he shared his life. Okay, verse 9. What does he say there? Okay, hard working. Okay, verse 10. How does he describe his ministry among them? His life among them? Pardon? Blameless. Yes. Holy. Blameless. Verse 11. How does he describe it? Like a father. Very good like a mother and like a father. 
Okay, verse 12. Encouraging, comforting, and urging. Encouraging, comforting, urging. I'm running out of board here. Uh, verse 13. How does he describe his ministry among them? Thankful. Yes, we thank God continually, okay? Okay, so there's prayer there. Prayer and thankfulness. We thank God continually for you. Uh, verse 17. How does he describe his uh, feelings towards them? Verse 17. How does he describe his feelings towards them? Intense longing. And uh, uh, 19 and 20, uh, they are his glory and his joy. 19 and 20, they're his glory and joy. And in um, I think we missed out 14 to 16, did we? Um, Verse 15, who killed all Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out, they displeased God and hostile to all men. Um, in the efforts to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles, they heap up their sins to the limit. So Paul is saying in 14 to 16 that he was sinned against in his ministry. Now, uh, all of this, you see, all of this describes... Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians, not only what was going on in his heart, how he felt towards them, but also what he actually did with them. Now notice in verse 2, we had previously suffered and had been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. Now that strong opposition is seen here. So you see, verse 2 applies here. Verse 2 was all this opposition that Paul was getting against himself and his ministry, and yet in spite of all that opposition, all that hatred, all that being sinned against, yet he continued to be like this towards them. Now that describes what pastoral counselling looks like. That kind of attitude towards people, that kind of heart towards people, those kinds of things. This is, this is, this is the job description, brothers and sisters. This is our job description. In spite of the fact that we are receiving opposition. Now, Satan will try to stop us. Well, many people will try to stop us. Non-Christian counsellors will try to stop us. You shouldn't be talking to people. You're untrained. You'll only do them damage. You see, in spite of all the opposition, Paul experienced opposition. People tried to destroy his ministry, yet he continued on. Now, uh, if we just to put alongside here what some of the secular equivalents are to some of these things here. The secular equivalents <coughs> includes... Uh, Respect, time to go home, empathy, <coughs> warmth, genuineness, genuineness, involvement, commitment, uh, and uh, um, relationship. Now, just as a matter of interest, in the secular counselling world, these are the kind of values that they emphasise as absolutely essential in order to establish effective counselling relationship. There has to be respect. You as the helper, there has to be respect from you and empathy and warmth and gentleness, involvement and commitment and relationship. Now, notice how all those aspects approximate what we've seen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, about how Paul approached his ministry. In other words, all these things, all these things 
are already here. Only to say that the Bible will tell us how to do our job. These guys, he says, not only Christians that do counselling, these guys are latching to the same things as well, but lo and behold, 2,000 years ago, Paul was doing it in Thessalonica. He was working hard. He was like a mother. He was like a father. He encouraged them. He prayed for them. He had an open heart towards them. Pure, honest, trustworthy. Isn't that encouraging? It's all there. To whom am I relating on a day-to-day -day basis? Am I willing to move beyond the casual? Small talk can become big talk. Someone in your church had a problem this week. Well, we have half a minute left. If anyone would like to ask a question or make a comment. Well, I'll pray and then um, the class will be over. But if you've please hand in your enrollment forms and um, and just on the books you'll be invoiced for the books um, in the next few weeks when we invoice you for your fees so don't worry about that it'll all come your way let's pray Father God we thank you that what is most important to you is most clear in scripture and what's most clear in scripture is that Jesus Christ has saved us from our sins and has given us all that we need to have an ministry in the lives of others that draws people more and more into conformity with the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the things that we've learnt this evening. Thank you for the opportunity we've had this evening to expose ourselves to the truth of your word. And Father, I pray for these students as they begin their readings and they begin to grapple with their self-counseling project. And they begin to talk here in class and to one another. And Father God, that you would give them the grace and mercy indeed to dig down into their own hearts and see where change can take place under gospel dynamics to make them fruitful and bountiful in a ministry of encouragement within the body of Christ. We thank you that this is what you desire. We thank you that you give all that's required for this to happen, and we ask, Lord, that you'd be pleased to have that happen in our lives this term as we work together before the face of God and in the name of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.